One of the biggest challenges we face with climate adaptation is understanding whether we're doing the right things and whether we're doing them right. Because we really don't have the time to, to fail to learn about what is effective adaptation. So I think monitoring the valuation is one of the key challenges for the adaptation community. And I think that means going beyond accountability, not just thinking about are we doing what we said we'd do, but actually thinking more fundamentally about what is effective and, and who is it effective for so we really get a depth of learning because we're running out of time with climate change. So if we're not learning and we're not then reflecting on and improving policy and practice pretty rapidly, we're going to find we're, we're reaching the limits to adaptation. So the challenge for me is how do we really learn from the practice that's going on at the moment? How do we learn about which policies are effective and how do we feed that back into to improve practice? Because at the moment, I think we're, we're only just beginning to investigate that properly. And I think if we don't learn, we're going to lose a lot of time and waste a lot of money um, instead of actually getting on with the job in, in hand, which is to, to implement adaptation. Well, um, well, we're here at Adaptation Futures 2016. And um, you've asked me what, what it's, what's the big challenge for adaptation. I think that's an interesting question and one of the things that is clear from the conference is that there's something like 1600 participants and we've seen a massive explosion of interest and um, potential activities and funding for adaptation over the last couple of years through the negotiation processes with the, the United Nations framework on climate change. And that means that there is now a huge amount of interest, a lot of funding coming through. And I think one of the challenges that we face from a developing country perspective, which is very much what I work on, is to identify what are the best ways to spend that money effectively and efficiently. We want to avoid waste. We want to make sure that we target the spending in a good way. We want to make sure that that that's funding is allocated equitably to the countries and to the communities within those countries that are most deserving of it, the ones who are most vulnerable and who are most exposed to the risks that climate change represents. And I think making sure that that happens in an efficient and equitable manner is a, is a big challenge for us. And that's something that the, as a community we need to be thinking very hard about. Some of the questions which are being discussed in relation to, to the conference here are all about how do we make sure that we can uh, target beneficiaries and communities effectively to, um, to receive that money and to use it efficient and efficiently. What are their priorities? How do they get involved in those processes? How do we make sure that that involvement is, is effective and, and, um, and, and valuable? And, and really to get a representation of their, their perspectives in this major process. I think it's probably two of the biggest challenges, or two of the biggest challenges that are probably equal, are um, one, how do we get communities involved and how do they remain involved? So how are we making sure that we're building projects and coming up with big infrastructure solutions that will also address today's problems that the communities are facing? And that's really important because communities aren't going to help plan something for a generation or two generations to come. They're going to help plan something that will enhance their neighborhood today. So that's one of the biggest problems. I would say the other biggest problem is how do we um, get our governments to prioritize this infrastructure spending? So governments spend billions and billions of dollars every year on infrastructure, yet they say they have no money for adaptation. I actually think we do have the money for adaptation. I think we just need to reprioritize the way that we're spending our infrastructure dollars and making sure that every dollar we spend also has some public benefit that will help communities and work towards the future to think about how do we want to build our cities for the next generation. Challenges. Well, I work in, I work in the Arctic with Inuit communities and in the Arctic we're seeing some of the most traumatic climate change anywhere on Earth. Um, over the last, the last 30 or so years we've seen temperatures increasing by about two degrees Celsius across the, the southern polar north. In some regions we're seeing temperatures in, increasing in excess of four degrees Celsius. This is having a huge number of impacts on the environment, later sea ice freeze up, gene changes in animal species. Uh, so I'd say one of the big challenges is around the speed of climate change, because we're really seeing transformation of climate change in, in Arctic regions. Uh, and moving forward, you know, the Arctic will experience the most climate change anywhere in, in, in the world. So the speed of climate change is, is a big concern for communities in the north. 
Uh, beyond that, there's also socio and economic challenges. You know, climate change is not occurring in isolation. It's occurring in the context of social and cultural and economic change. So for the communities I work, I work in, in in Northern Canada, one of the big issues is a, a weakening of traditional knowledge uh, systems, knowledge about how to engage in the environment safely and successfully. And there's concern that many younger generations aren't learning this, this, this knowledge uh, for a variety of reasons. So what this means is the climate is changing, it's becoming more dangerous for Inuit to engage in their traditional activities like hunting and fishing and traveling on the sea ice. At the same time that many younger generations don't know how to identify those dangers or to deal with them. Things such as land safety, how to recognize dangerous conditions on the sea ice, knowledge on survival skills. These are extremely important skills in light of climate change impacts, but many of the younger generations don't necessarily have the, the same skills that they, they once had. So there's a huge concern here that as the climate changes uh, very, very fast, that many people don't have the skills to, to, deal, to, to deal with them. Other challenges are things like institutions. You know, we're seeing a lot of interest in adaptation in Northern Canada. We're seeing programs by territorial governments, by federal governments in Canada. Um, but the challenge comes, there's a lot of talk, but the implementation is often a big issue. Implementation takes money, it takes resources, it takes institutional commitment. It takes leadership at the very highest levels of policy making. And those are areas where we see significant challenges, not only in the Arctic, but, 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 but globally. Um, in fact, if we look at you know, policy making in various, various areas of the Arctic, not just Northern Canada, but across the Second Polar North, we look at policies in health, in education, in infrastructure, uh, in economy. In all those areas, very rarely do we see climate change being considered and what that means is we're seeing, we are seeing a very different climate in the future. Those policies will be affected by climate change. Uh, those policies will also affect the vulnerability of the resilience of communities to climate change. Yet climate change is not being considered uh, really across the board. So another big challenge, if we to do, if we to adapt and adapt well, we need buy-in across levels of government in communities and leadership at the very high, highest levels. Things which we've not really seen yet, but I'm quite optimistic, I, I do think, you know. Moving forward, especially now that the Paris Agreement, a new government in Canada, that we can see more positive action moving forward. Uh, basically, basically uh, Bhutan, uh, our country is a uh, mountain, a fragile mountain ecosystem. So we actually face uh, uh, various impacts of climate change. And uh, now the only thing we need to, we have to do, and we you know, should be doing, is to actually you know be resilient to climate change or adapt to climate change, because whether you like it or not climate change uh, is happening it, it's ongoing so we have to adapt to now the challenges that we actually face uh, while coming up with uh, you know, uh, adaptation uh, programs is because uh, one thing is uh, you know, funding uh, to actually uh, get funding to you know, uh, come up with the climate change adaptation programs and also over and above that uh, since climate change is not just uh, you know, uh, it's not just one sector or one stakeholder who can actually play a vital role in climate change but it's a multi-stakeholder kind of uh, uh, approach needed so therefore you can't you know there would be some adaptation programs being done by one sector uh, uh, for example uh, the national environment commission does one uh, or for example the minister of agriculture might do one but you know, to do it one uh, all together, you know, coming up with a com uh, approach, uh, you know, common approach is, is is a challenge. But however, in Bhutan, uh, we are doing it fairly well because we involved, for example, through multi you know technical climate uh, you know, multi uh, multi technical uh, uh, there is this climate change committee. So uh, through that, we actually discuss. We are all kept on board. Uh, and we are basically trying to you know, uh, know uh, keep on board each other like each agency is doing the role uh, and therefore we are doing actually fairly well but you know these are uh, uh, some of the challenges that we are actually facing I'd like to turn that question around this meeting adaptation futures 2016 is really exciting as I recall, the very first chapter on adaptation in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was the third assessment report, and the scientific community at that point in time was probably around 100 scientists. There's 1,600 people here, and it's not even the entire community. The research that's being presented is exciting, there's so much work going on, working directly with decision makers and 
policymakers and making sure that people are aware of the risks of a changing climate. People are finding ways to communicate that risk, to identify what can be done to reduce vulnerability to climate change, to find ways to increase resilience as we go forward into a very different future.